Hello, uh, this is SK Williams, and the following was recorded in 2017. It's rambling. It is a horrible commentary. It was not well structured. I didn't know what I was doing back then, but I hope you enjoy it regardless. And now on to the presentation. Hello, uh, this is SK Williams, and I would like to present a discussion today regarding the nature of religion and philosophy. We live in a world in which we know that some people are religious and other people are not religious. I, however, disagree with that consensus. I believe everyone is religious, including atheists who insist they are not religious, and who, now that I have said this, will confront me with the usual snide remarks of how atheism isn't a religion, it's a lack of belief in a god. And of course will tell me something trite like, atheism is a religion like bald is a hair color, atheism is a religion like not collecting stamps is a hobby, atheism is a religion like not playing sports is a sport, and so on and so forth. However, I never said atheism is a religion. And one of the things that really irritates me is the assumption that if atheism is not a religion, then atheists are not religious. That's not how that works. But I'm not here to discuss militant atheists, at least not specifically. Rather, I'm interested in looking at our modern secular culture, which has largely thought of itself as not being based upon religion. And I don't just mean the militant or strident atheist or even strident secularists. I mean those who even see themselves as devoutly religious but want to live in a world of the separation of church and state and who think that religion mixed with government is a bad idea. The simple truth of the matter is, though, modern-day secularism is its own form of religion. We don't think of it as such, but it is. Just as things that we typically don't think of as religion are seen as culture or history, but are really religion. In America, for example, we have a story of how people came to America for freedom and how the pilgrims forced to worship the king's religion and merely wanting to worship God according to the dictates of their conscience came to the new world for religious freedom. The story of how America grew from that seed of freedom and the story of how America was enslaved to a tyrannical king who kept them in brutal oppression until heroic men of the founding era, led by the founding fathers, great heroes all, rose up and liberated us from the tyranny of this king, but not just the tyranny of this king, but all kings, for they realized kings are tyrants by definition, and gave the power to who it truly belonged to, we the people. This is generally seen as history, and it is not seen as religion, but what people don't seem to understand is that religion is largely concerned with history. Whether you believe the biblical stories are true or not, for example, the stories within them are set within a historical context and define the Israelite culture, which for some odd reason people think of as the Jewish culture, because the Old Testament was written by the Jews. This is of course not accurate. But it is how people tend to talk about it. Like when atheists love to say that the Bible forces people to go into slavery, if I were to point out that it also mentions they must be released, they'll always tell me, only if they're Jewish. Only Jewish slaves were released. If you weren't Jewish, you could be a slave for life. Which of course means that 11 out of the 12 tribes of Israel could be enslaved for life. Not that the atheist would understand that this is what they're saying. To them, the Old Testament was written by the Jews. Israelite and Jew means the same thing. And when the law said that you would release the Israelites, it meant the Jews. There were only the Jews. And I've even had some atheists tell me about the 12 tribes of the Jews. The Jews, however, were only one of the 12 tribes. 
this is important, trust me. I'm not simply going off on a tangent. But the point I'm making is this. Israel has a story of how Abraham was called by God and given a chosen land of Canaan, and how his descendants, such as Moses, would eventually claim that land. How his grandchildren were sent to Egypt, and how there they became slaves for 400 years until Moses led them out of slavery and onto the Promised Land. Moses, of course, delivered the law to the people, which he got from God on Mount Sinai. You have other stories as well in the Bible that define the Hebrew culture. Stories of King David and the other kings of Israel, for example. All of these set within a historical context, and all of them defining the uh, cultural heritage of the people of Israel. And to that end, they are like America's stories of the pilgrims coming for freedom, and the struggle for freedom through independence through the American Revolution. They aren't just events that happened in history, but events that encapsulate the principles and ideals to which we should live by. America is a republic in which we, the people, have ultimate sovereignty because of what the Founding Fathers did. Their philosophy of republicanism is embodied in the Revolution, and it's not just the Revolution or the Pilgrims. Other events loom large on the American consciousness and define what people think of when they think of America. Be they vague stories of the western frontier and expansion of cowboys, where, while there are of course notable famous names, the overall narrative is more generalized, to a more specific story of freeing the slaves in the Civil War, where noble President Lincoln fought to free the slaves and to keep the Union together against the machinations of the South. And there are global conflicts that also define what it means to be an American, like World War II, or events like Vietnam. These things have entered not simply the history books, but the public consciousness, and define what it means to be an American. And other nations have similar stories. Britain, for instance, has Napoleon being defeated at Waterloo, or the stories of Queen Elizabeth the Great the first stories of Richard the Lionheart. France has its revolution, but also its ancient histories, and China has 5,000 years worth of such tales. Japan has millennia. And these stories, historically, were tied to religion. You cannot separate the stories of Japanese emperors and samurai and the history of the Japanese people from antiquity from their religious traditions. Neither can you with China. We conceptualize Western history as distinct from religion, especially at the start of the modern era, around the 1500s. And unless the history is about a struggle over religion, such as during the Protestant Reformation and the wars between Catholics and Protestants, we tend to think of history as not really concerned with or being about religion. But we don't seem to understand that this is what religion largely is. Of course, I'm told I'm wrong. The official definition of religion is the belief in a superhuman controlling agency or agencies, especially a personal god or gods. This is how the dictionary defines religion and what the word means. Of course, this is disingenuous. The same dictionary that posts that definition also has five or six others, and you can find dozens of dictionaries that do not agree. The term religion is not purely about believing in a superhuman controlling agency or belief in gods or the supernatural. And if you study religion, as I have, large parts of religious belief boil down to the history of the people involved, not simply the gods they worship. They are about the principles and ideals they follow, whether those ideals are given by a god or not being largely irrelevant. But even if they are given by a god, it isn't good enough to believe that this god exists. 
It isn't even good enough to merely worship this god in a generic fashion. You must worship the god as the god requested, and live as the god has told you to live, according to the moral dictates he has taught. Religion, therefore, transcends the mere belief that a god exists, and carries on to the will of that god and the way of life of the people. And even without a god, we have the will of the people which can replace it. The will of reason, the will of science, the will of the majority, the will of the masses, the will of the culture, the will of the people, the will of mankind. It is no different than the will of God, and for those who disagree, keep in mind many atheists insist the communists were religious, for they worshipped the state as if it was a god, and had a holy book, the Communist Manifesto, and a sacred prophet, Karl Marx. The same atheist who would insist they have no religion by virtue of their atheism would turn around and say other atheists were in fact religious, even though the same could be said of them. They worship science and reason, for instance. They have their holy books, like the God Delusion, or Thomas Paine's Age of Reason. But they would tell me that this is different. They don't worship science, they just recognize its truth. And they would tell me that it is wrong for me to tell them they worship science as a god, and from there say science is their god. How dare I tell them what they believe? How dare I define it for them? And yet that's exactly what they do with the communists. For not a single communist said, we should worship the state as if it is a god, much less did they call the state a god. They did not say that instead of worshipping God, we should worship the state. They did not say, the Communist Manifesto is our sacred scripture. They did not hold up Karl Marx as an actual prophet. The communists would have been just like them, denying that they worship the state as a god, denying that they view the Communist Manifesto as sacred scripture. And yet these atheists could say it doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter that they say they don't worship the state as a god. Their actions, not their words, are important, and they clearly did. But again, it's different with them. What they say they are is what is important for them. If the atheist community today says they do not worship science, we must take them at their word. But if the communists deny worshipping the state, ignore them. They clearly did. The atheist gets to define it all for them, at least the modern atheist. And I suppose they have to, because... They try and put a lot of distance between themselves and the communists. And yet, they believe the same things as the communists do. They are broadly politically liberal. They tend to believe science and reason will lead us to truth, and that science and religion are in conflict, and that religion is a danger and should be abolished, just as the communists. And of course, people have killed in the name of religion. And people have killed in the name of communism, but no one has killed in the name of atheism. This is all disingenuous, of course. People have killed in the name of atheism. The communists have killed in the name of atheism, as have other revolutionaries in Mexico or France. But they want you to believe they haven't. Because they wish to present a conflict not simply between science and religion as abstractions, such as, did we evolve or were we specially created by a god? But rather, to present it as atheists giving us a peaceful society in which conflict has ended because they use reason and science to settle differences, as opposed to religion which destroys science, gives us the dark ages, and leads to endless war. Religion is violent. Atheism is peaceful. Or so the narrative goes. And that is perhaps what is the most important aspect of religion, the, I, the ability to identify yourself with it and define who you are as an individual, and who you are as a group. That's what these stories actually are, and in fact can be that even if you don't believe they are actually true, or true in a literal sense. For example, our cultural heritage includes things like fairy tales, Little Red Riding Hood, Goldilocks, Cinderella. These stories are important to us, and we generally see them as teaching us something about humanity or morality, but I don't think many people view them as true stories. And that's ultimately the nature of religion itself. The ritual, the stories, the common prayers, they're all there to reinforce certain values and a sense of identity. 
That's not to say you shouldn't believe any part of any religion has any literal truth to it. In fact, most of them do. Jesus Christ really existed as a man, although I know some atheists would deny that. Historians don't. And I am well aware that many historians disagree. For example, Richard Carrier. It's always Richard Carrier who is mentioned as an example. As if there are many, and this was pulled off the top of your heads, please don't bring him up. He is a charlatan, and no, there aren't many you could name besides him. Anyone who tries will mention people who aren't historians, like Robert Price, whilst others would uh, simply pretend that there are many, but they really can't name them, and will tell me something trite like, I'm not here to do your homework for you, or something along those lines. At any rate, the key defining nature of stories in religion is that they are mythology, and I don't mean that in the way a lot of people do. A myth is not a story that is not true. A myth is a story that transcends the historical nature of the story that is being told to encapsulate a higher truth. A myth can be 100% true and still be a myth if it embodies such a principle. Stories of the American Revolution, for example, refer back to an event that really happened, the American Revolution, but they mean more to an American than just this thing that happened historically. They define why America's a republic, why Americans disdain monarchy, why Americans think that we the people should have our say, and they define that rebellious streak and that honor of the rebel that Americans have. Just as the concept of science and religion being at odds with each other, and in constant conflict, with science giving us the truth because it uses evidence and religion holding us back because it gives us nothing but myths and perhaps because the evil church knows the truth that these are just stories but uses them to control people so they can get money and power. Things along those lines, they define why you follow this belief system in the first place and how you react. And that is the nature of religious mythology. It isn't so much about a story that isn't true or one that is true, but rather it is one that allows ideas to be embodied so that you can more readily understand them and see how they would connect to the real world and so that you may be inspired by them. So that you can understand the ideas and principles and how we should behave. I don't have much else to say about this, so I'm going to sign off now. I hope it has been an interesting ramble. Thank you, God bless, and goodbye.